Thank you very much. Yeah, it's flattering for us people to find that people are fighting for chairs. And then I hope everyone will find a place to sit with me. More relaxed standing there. Anyway, it's it's indeed my pleasure to to be here and uh, I hope my host don't mind that I took the invitation. Literally, not even my neighborhood gave us a, a call and uh, to see us, well, that's what I did. And I'm very pleased that I'm enjoying great hospitality uh, in this area. Um, yes, so uh, as you've seen, uh, my talk is about, yeah, about some fundamental questions of quantum mechanics. Now, when you and I mentioned this, I must immediately add what my motivation is because um, <coughs> there has been lots and lots of dispute about what quantum mechanics really is and um, whether or not there is some theory underneath quantum mechanics. And uh, this has been going on for practically a century. And, uh, one could rightly ask, why am I interested in this? Am I one of those people who doesn't believe all the quantum mechanics, who wants to find something better, and uh, <coughs> for rather dubious philosophical reasons? Um, while we all know that quantum mechanics works just perfectly, right? as, as a basic uh, foundation of all the number theories of the subatomic world, and in general, the world of very tiny and light things, quantum mechanics just serves us beautifully. So why should we want anything uh, to be changed about that? So um, my motivation is not a philosophical one, although you enter into philosophical questions anyway. But my motivation <coughs> is in physics. My motivation is I want to understand better what happens at the Planck scale. And uh, right now, I'm. Uh, my, my vision of what, about what happens on the Planck scale is very muddy and I don't understand lots of things. And I think one of the problems is that there are some things, quantum mechanics, which you might cease to believe. Suppose that there would be an underlying theory that is the theory at the Planck scale, but that theory would be at the same time explaining what quantum mechanics is and why we have it. Um, and uh, so, so I've been asking questions of this sort. And um, one of the <coughs> beautiful examples of closed theories was I'm looking for basically what would the theory everything be like? What would be the ultimate equations of nature? How could they possibly look? And uh, one of, of the places where you can look is where you have a sort of complete model of the universe. And there are some beautiful, simple, complete models of mini superspace where um, you have some equations and those equations dictate how a universe evolves under all circumstances. The nice example of that is uh, one of the people who work on that topic very high, which is two plus one dimensional gravity. If you take the, the universe as it is, the equations as they are, but you remove one dimension, things become fundamentally much simpler. In, in two dimensions, there is no gravitational field really, there's only topology. And um, uh, there are no gravitational waves, there is no, um, <coughs> no tidal force, and uh, yet there is gravity in 2 plus 1 which is very non-trivial indeed. And classically you can solve the, things, the gravitational equations exactly, because all particles move in straight lines, but those straight lines are not straight lines in ordinary space, but in some crazy curved space. And, um, uh, the curvature is very fundamental, very simple. Uh, so in that theory, uh, you can basically consider what happens if you put 26 particles in a closed universe. And you can just switch on the button. You start with the particles from configuration. You switch on the button and let the particles evolve. And you ask what happens. Classically, the question can be completely answered. And it's just uh, fun to play with those equations, which I did uh, a long time ago. Just to play with the classical equations, see what happens. Right? Then, particles expand, the universe is expanding, and sometimes the universe goes back in, into a big crunch again, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, uh, the nice thing about that is, well, is you feel like being God, because you can solve 
Ja, en annan kontroll av den här universitetet. Vill du göra det simpelt än A, så är det bara att ställa sig på det. Och läs mer än tre partiklar, så att säga. Så få partiklar och mer än en close universe än en entire universe att göra sig på det. Now, that model is very easy to solve classically. So what does it look like if you make it quantum mechanical? You think a little bit in time, actually, you can't make that model quantum mechanical. You can do it, as many people have done, by saying that it's part of an infinite scheme, it's part of a universe as a boundary. Then you can subject it to the quantum rules. But suppose the universe is just closed. Would that be unreasonable to think that our universe is closed as well, or our universe could be made to be closed? bubble could split off or something like that. How would that bubble evolve as a closed universe? Well, then uh, you have a very similar situation. And you discover you can't quantize that. And then the reason for it is rather simple and straightforward. The energy of that universe will be constant. And there's nothing you can do about it. The energy will be one number that you can measure. So the universe will be in an energy eigenstate. If the universe is in an energy eigenstate, it cannot evolve because the energy eigenstates are just oscillator functions in time. So nothing happens. That can't be right. And of course it isn't right because the time variable uh, opposite that energy is just a uh, uh, conjugated energy is basically just a, uh, a gauge parameter. It's something that you can freely uh, change without changing the physics, <coughs> which means that the, that time variable is not the time variable you really want. So you have to ask questions of this sort. But then, when you do this within the frame of quantum mechanics, you can run into all sorts of difficulties. So I tried very hard to understand that situation better from a quantum mechanical point of view, until I realized that actually the best way to quantize that model is not to quantize it at all. But to say that every state that it is in is, by definition, an element of Hilbert space, uh, an element of a basis of Hilbert space. And then you may or may not decide to consider superpositions at your own risk. You take any two elements of Hilbert space and superimpose them and ask what happens. And that is a way of quantizing theory that does seem to work. Now, that was a theme that I, I continued uh, researching, and I found many peculiar features. I'll, I'll, I'll explain basically one of those in this lecture, but there are other features as well which are highly intriguing. And, um, okay, here comes actually another motivation which I forgot to mention. That is that when I was a student, a graduate student, um, I was in my physics department of our university had, um, uh, had a large sec section on statistical physics. And they were considering the Ising problem. The Ising problem is a very basic uh, question. It's, um, uh, the Ising problem uh, has, uh, describes an infinite grid with ones and zeros on them. Or here, say the ones are black and the zeros are white and yellow, they aren't going care. But um, there are ones and zeros on the grid, and there are two rules. First rule is the, 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 the grid is very big, but the number of blacks is equal to the number of whites. Rule number one. Rule number two is I fix the number of boundaries between white and black. Now that is, is what makes the problem hard. If you just ask how many ways can I put blacks and whites such that the number of blacks is equal to the number of whites, that problem is easy to solve mathematically. What is very hard to solve is what happens if you know how many boundaries there are with two different uh, entries and sitting adjacent to each other. How many ways can you do that? So knowing that people in our uh, physics department were interested in, in that particular model, I said, well, you know, I think I'm good in mathematics. I can, I, let's see if I can solve it. Only to discover I couldn't solve it. It was too difficult for me. And then I talked to my friends and uh, said, this is just I said, how do you solve this model? They said, yes, it can be solved. You look up the paper by Bruria Kalfa, 1949. She wrote down how to solve. Actually, that was a student of Lars Onzager. Onzager discovered the solution of this model. And um, uh, so I looked at that paper, and I found, I found two amazing things. One is that it was very cleverly done. It contained kind of mathematics I had never even considered in, in using to solve this. But um, the other thing was that the mathematics used was quantum field theory. Now, the question has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. <coughs> the solution, the answer to the question also has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. There is no Hilbert space in, on, on a checkerboard. If you play chess, nobody plays chess when you take account how you superimpose to, to moves or something. <laughs> you don't do that. 
But you use the method of quantum mechanics to solve this problem. So quantum mechanics here is a tool, not a theory. And so this always stuck to my mind. Here is an example. Quantum mechanics is a tool and not a theory. What about the real world? We have quantum mechanics as a theory. Right? We think that the world is quantum mechanical. But why? Maybe it could be that the world seems to be quantum mechanical because we have to use quantum mechanics as a tool to solve classical equations. After all, the answer to those equations is what happens when you do an experiment, when you see particles going here and there, and then when you, uh, uh, well, you do an LHC-like experiment, or when you uh, study a, a, some substance in a, at its critical point, something like that. That's the kind of experiments you can do, but those experiments are classical. The, um, the answers you get when you detect things are classical answers. The, the method to use to compute, to predict the answer outcome, that's quantum mechanics, in particular quantum field theory. Maybe quantum field theory is just a tool and not a, uh, a, a fundamental uh, underlying theory. So that was the theme which I wanted to investigate. Now, so when can, you, I, can I just, yes. um, so I think you meant this last comment as in a very heuristic way, and I mm -hmm. accepted it that, but it doesn't necessarily, for, for all the tests of really quantum mechanical phenomena that have succeeded, it's a little hard to imagine how I take that example from the icing. So the thing, your example from the icing model, yes. you return to a classical discussion. Yes. And, well, and so I'm in some sense it was some subset of, of the quantum behavior that you cared about at well, the end. Well, what I mean here is that, well, it would be an entire lecture to show yeah. how to solve this model quantum mechanically. And so what you do is, um, well, <coughs> uh, yeah, you, you use a so-called transfer matrix. I don't know how many people in statistical physics know that, but, but basically you, you, you take the, the position of one entire row here, all the blacks and the whites, and then you ask how many ways can I put the second row. And that's described by a matrix, and what you have to do is then analyze that matrix and find its, uh, its biggest eigenvalue. And uh, then you take the exponent to the target value, and then you get the answer to the question. Unfortunately, to the analyze the matrix, that's the hard part here, because the matrix is still infinite. It goes from minus infinity to plus infinity on this lattice. So you have to diagonalize and find the highest eigenvalue of an infinite, infinite matrix. And that was beyond my abilities at that time, until someone showed that actually this is called mechanics. If you, if you rewrite this thing, by what you call the order liquid transformation in terms of a, quant a fermionic quantum field theory, then you say these are just, you don't recognize them, but these are electrons which are freely moving. Do you see freely moving electrons here now? <laughs> but these are freely moving, they are free <coughs> particles in one, in one space, one time dimension. Because they're free particles, we can solve the thing trivially and uh, find all, all, all the eigenstates of this matrix. And uh, so, so that was, in, in a nutshell, the answer. And, uh, but that was a, a, a quantum, this was a, a quantum mechanical matrix. You do the same thing as what you do in Schrodinger's equation, where you want the energy eigenstates. That's exactly what you're doing. The energy eigenstates of the quantum problem describe these things as if they were fermions. And um, uh, I found it so amazing that you use quantum field theory to solve a classical problem. The answer, of course, was, was, was again classical. You have to take the large eigenvalue, exponentiate uh, the whole thing, and uh, eventually you find the answer is just a number, a mathematical number. And you find the critical point of the system, that is, if the number of, of bounds is small or big, there's a, there's a critical <coughs> value where this whole thing starts to show long-range correlations. And uh, all that can be calculated in this particular model. And um, I, I found it so beautiful that I thought, well, maybe quantum mechanics, as you know, is something very similar. Whenever you say so a thing like this, you get this argument throwing at you. And that's John Bell, who, uh, and, and many of you must know this argument, um, John Bell uh, made a, a quantitative description of what already had been described long ago by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, who basically were thinking of, this, of a similar setup. Although they didn't talk about spin, they talked about position and momentum of particle, but that's all in detail. <coughs> Uh, John Bell did something slightly clever, cleverer than that. He had he considered a source that may produce an unstable <coughs> atom, an atom that can only decay by emitting two photons. Experimentalists know how to do that. 
because an, an atom, if the atom is in an S state, it can only decay into an atom which again is in an S state. It cannot do that by emitting one photon. It can only do that by emitting two photons at once. You can also say uh, it, it first decays into a slightly higher level at a very short time, and then that other uh, <coughs> J equal one level can emit another photon uh, and go back to the S state. Anyway, there's a way for this thing to emit two photons, and uh, uh, the two photons together, uh, well, they, they go in opposite directions. So now the, all you have to do is, is discover, describe those two photons. Those two photons are what we call entangled. So um, because the total spin is zero, as soon as you measure the spin of one, fo one photon going in this direction, you know the spin of the other photon because two spins add up, uh, add up to zero. So whatever the spin is, that spin is the opposite. And um, then you take two observers. They were later, what became customary to call them Alice and Bob, A and B. And um, uh, Alice is doing a measurement here, Bob is a measurement there. And these spots of the measurements are light years away from each other. So Alice and Bob cannot directly communicate with each other. Only uh, signals from here can be sent both to Alice and to Bob. But once they are doing the measurements, uh, it'll take a while before they can actually compare their notes. They have to send signals back and, and around th this time, they can actually compare their notes again. And, um, uh, but they, make a, they, they measure many of these photons, they measure their spins, and, and very importantly, when they measure spin, they can choose which component of spin to measure. So both Alice and Bob choose an axis along which they measure the spin, if those axes just happen to be parallel, then you know that Alice and Bob measure spin which are directly opposite. If they're not parallel, they measure some, some statistical distribution. And you can check the tables that they make and verify this is exactly what happens. You, you can verify that the quantum mechanical description of this decaying atom is correct and, uh, and that indeed uh, Alice and Bob, uh, uh, their measurements agree with that. Now, when you think that this is part of a classical system where quantum mechanics only was a tool, nothing more than that, you run into a problem. And, and Bell made it quantitative. He said that if you, if you think of this photon actually being attached, uh, having a flag attached to it, and this photon has a flag attached to it, and you think that, that the flag tells you that if you measure spin in this direction, that this answer, if you measure spin in that direction, that that answer, and this photon, same thing, but that way, you cannot reproduce the tables predicted by quantum mechanics. The experiment has actually been done. There's a very famous experiment, started off with Anna Aspect, but there are many other people who also did the experiment in very different ways. And now you have many different ways of phrasing the same feature. If you, you can actually do the experiment and discover quantum mechanics to work just perfectly. And, uh, and that means that, according to Bell, you cannot reproduce such a result for any any imaginable, conceivable, classical uh, uh, procedure. In fact, Bell did more than that. He sort of proved that you can't do this classically. So just because you can't reproduce the result in any classical experiment, people say there's no way in which you can understand quantum mechanics as a classical theory. So that is then the end of the argument for most people. And um, so I want to say a little bit more, this is just um, uh, the Bell's result, that uh, the best thing you can do in any classical model is that the correlation between the two spins, if two axes are parallel, they're completely anti-correlated. You can re reproduce that in a classical model. It's an uh, anti-parallel and uh, completely correlated. This is just the angle of the relative axis. But if these angles are somewhere in between, its angles are 90 degrees, by the way, they're not correlated at all, both classically and quantum mechanically. But the classical model cannot give a better correlation than one half here in the middle, whereas quantum mechanics gives you one over square root of two. So quantum mechanics gives you a higher correlation function than the classical theory. There's no way in which you can make a classical theory with this solid line correlation function. The best thing you can do is a dotted line correlation function. That's what Bell proved. And, um, and then later, this is, uh, generalized in many, many ways. But, um, so this was the difficulty. And um, <coughs> now I want to show you why you nevertheless can make models which I would characterize as being on the borderline. You can say these models are quantum mechanical, you can also say these models are classical, 
It's the same model. So there are models which can describe both as classical things and quantum mechanics things, and they're the same things. Now, to me, it looks as if our universe could be a model of this sort. And, um, but you have to be patient. I will try to explain what kind of models they are and um, uh, why I'm interested in those models, because those models seem to be contradicting what Bell said, except that the models I'm going to describe are far too simple. They're so simplistic that they're not describing the universe as we know. They don't describe the standard model. So they don't describe in John Bell writing applications or an uh, experimentalist doing experiments with entangled photons. Those things are all too difficult for these models. In other words, yes, I can make models which, which are both classical and quantum mechanical at the same time, but no, they're not models described in the real world. So that is still a problem. However, the models I'm going to describe, I'll explain this in a minute, the models I'm going to describe are sufficiently structured that they suggest that maybe there's a way to generalize the models and maybe there is a way to have theories as complex as a standard model described as something of this sort. I haven't reached the point yet. What I have done is something I find interesting, but uh, I'll just leave it to your own judgment. Anyway, um, here is a little theorem that's very useful. It's the following thing. I can consider a classical theory which processes pairs of integers. I call them Q and P. Q and P of course, remind one of classical mechanics where the Q is a position and P is a momentum. But in these models, Qs and Ps are just integers. And I don't care what they represent. If you think one is position, one is momentum, be my guess, but you can also think of them in any other way. I don't care. There's two N integers. These theories are deterministic. Like my Ising model, there's no quantum mechanics in the description of this model. However, if you have such a deterministic model, you might run into a situation where the situation is too complicated to compute. In principle, everything happens as in a computer, as in a laptop. There's no quantum mechanics in the programs of a laptop. So, um, so you can use classical physics to solve the system. But that classical physics might become much too difficult in practice to solve. There may be more powerful schemes to solve these models. And that is by mapping them onto a quantum theory. And a quantum theory has just n real observables, which you may or may not Fourier transform. So those real observables are lowercase qi, and they associate momenta, are pi. And these q's are much related to this one, and these momenta are very much related to these. Now my claim is there is an interesting class of models where you can make the exact dual transformation from here to here. In other words, these model, models would represent the same physics. So in some cases, maybe the quantum mechanics will be more useful to make statistical predictions than trying to solve the exact physical model. I'm not yet that far, but I can explain to you how this mapping goes. And, um, oh, by the way, if this theory is deterministic, this theory will automatically become quantum mechanical. There's no way to make this thing deterministic because it works with uh, the real numbers, which are much larger. Now, some people, when they see this, they start to shout and argue. They say, wait a minute, the class of real numbers we know is much, much bigger than the class of integers. Even pairs of integers are not that big. Yes, but in quantum mechanics, if um, your real number uh, cues, if you look at very tiny details of, of real numbers, you are looking at states of very high momentum p. If your Hamiltonian excludes very high momentum because they cost too much energy, you want to make an energy cutoff, then then the, the real numbers and, and the momenta become discrete again, and uh, then it looks more like this situation here. So you might say, I look at quantum theories where there's some limit to the momentum. In fact, what I do here, I take infinite sequences of integers, and infinite um, arrays of real numbers here, and then, um, and then I'll, I'll show to you in a minute how, how this works. And the argument, uh, it's basically very simple. Let me, oh, by the way, uh, in most of these arguments, it's sometimes convenient to take a different base to the natural logarithm. Normally, E is the base of the logarithm. E is 2.7, uh, 2.8, and so on. But I take E to the power of 2 pi as my base, which is 5.35. Sometimes it's convenient to use E to the pi. So I give it a different <laughs> name, absolutely. And uh, E to 2 pi. And then, um, 
Then, then if I have <laughs> a sequence of integers, I can span a Hilbert space on that. I can say every integer corresponds to an, 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 an basis element of Hilbert space. And that's totally legal. You have many examples of this. You can think of the harmonic oscillator. Well, there you have only the positive integers. Well, let's take two harmonic uh, oscillators then. You're going to have the positive integers here, and I'll put a minus sign in front of the second harmonic oscillator. So you can certainly think of Hilbert space that has a whole sequence of integers as its basis elements. And then I can introduce an operator I call eta. Uh, so in my description today, I will take capitals to be integer numbers, lower cases to be real numbers, Greek letters to be angles. So normally angles are between 0 and 2 pi or something like that, but if I use that other basis, then my angles run between minus 1 half and 1 half. So I make the angles um, just fit on the unit line, which I don't like to have run from 0 to 2 pi all the time, because that 2 pi is, is a nuisance in the calculations. So, um, epsilon to the power i eta raised to the power n is just causing a shift. It, it, it transforms my element q to the element q plus n. And that's just a very basic operator. This is just basically the nth power of a displacement operator. In physics, you all know this operator quite well. It's just momentum on a discrete space. So eta is just momentum of the discrete space. Think of a solid state where you have atoms, uh, you have a grid of atoms. You can make a displacement operator one atom at a time. And that operator is like momentum, except it only makes integer displacements. Therefore, the momentum is bounded by a Bruin zone in the uh, solid. And so the momentum is bounded between, well, if you choose units correctly, it will be min between minus one half and one half. So I have an oper a, a momentum operator which just sits on the, on the line segments from zero to one or from minus one half to plus one half. And um, now I can ask, how can I actually? Construct. I, I know how to make this place the operator of one step. That's just an operator which replaces all particles in C, or whatever you call them, one step to the right. How do I produce eta itself? Well, that is very easy. To compute, to find an operator eta which has this property, all you have to say, well, eta can be rewritten as a superposition of powers e to the i n eta. That's what we call Fourier transformation. So all we have to do is take a Fourier transform on the real line. So on the real line, the minus one half and one half, I take all the Fourier coefficients, all the sine, sine functions of, of eta, sines of n times eta. And eta itself is a real line going from here to here. So all I really want is to Fourier transform this real line. So the real line is a superposition of sines and cosines. From here, it's just only sines. The, if I go a, a further than the segment minus one half and one half, the thing flips back. So then you have a sawtooth function. But uh, on, this, on the, the segment minus one half, one half, this is just this line. And this line is, can easily be seen to be a superposition of signs. And the coefficients are calculated in this expression. This integral can readily be performed. We find an oscillating coefficient minus one to the nth divided by n. And yes, there's a two pi here, but two pi doesn't do any pi in the rest of the calculations. Uh, but the nice thing about using the second minus one half one half is that no problem with normalizing these iron modes. The norms are just one. And so um, that's what makes the calculation easy. You don't have to worry about norms, and therefore I chose that basis. Now, um, now the next thing you can do is compute. This gives you the, ma the matrix elements because it says that uh, uh, from Q1 to Q2, if the if you, if you move n units from q1 to q2, there's a 1 over n in the matrix element and then minus 1 to the n. So if n is q1 minus q2, then this becomes this expression. And um, uh, yeah, this is just that operator. But I have to multiply it with 1 minus delta q1 q2. If q1 equals q2, I have the zero displacement. But um, that's a Fourier coefficient of the zero Fourier coefficient of the straight line, but if I choose it to run from minus one half to one half, the zero coefficient vanishes. So if q1 equals q2, I can't use this expression, but what I can do is I put a one minus delta in front, so that it's zero if q1 equals q2. <coughs> Strictly speaking, you might say, well, 
uh, it's undetermined because it's zero divided by zero log. Okay, I'll say if q1 equals q2, this equation ought to be zero. So that's an easy calculation. And then um, that has some nice consequence. If you compute the commutator between this eta operator and q itself, the commutator, you get the matrix elements of that. Oh, I forgot the bra here somehow. Um, uh, if you compute the commutator between these, uh, the, this matrix elements of the commutator, then you have to multiply with q1 minus q2. If you multiply this with q1 minus q2, this denominator just vanishes, and I'm left over with a minus 1 to the q1 minus q2, this minus 1. Except when they are zero, because then this multi is multiplied by, by this quantity, and that still survives. So you have the minus 1 to the q1 minus q2, but then we also have this delta function. And that sticks there. So what this expression then leads to is you get the commutator, you get this delta function that gives you i over 2 pi. That in my notation is the usual commutator between the position, position and the momentum. But then this minus 1 to the q1 minus q2 can be rewritten as the product of two states, of a bra and a cat. That state psi is just minus 1 to the power of q. So, yeah, I get the usual commutator between momentum and position, and I get the correction term saying that there's a, a one particular state psi, which is just the alternating state, eternally alternating, that for which this quantity isn't i, but is zero. So, um, so that's why I have this expression. And um, uh, so, in other words, I get the canonical computation rule with one exception, the so-called edge state. The edge state is a state which in the eta eigenstate will be just on this corner. On this corner, if something illegal happens, this, this real line flips back down. So this here gives you an anomaly in the computation rule. We can also say that's a set of measures zero. There's only one state for which the equations are wrong. For all the other states, the equations are correct. So I will ignore the edge state. So I'll leave out this thing and then say, look, eta and q have the canonical commutation rules. So leave out this one single state for which it's wrong, which is the state where you sit on the statue. And um, now what I'm going to do, for a moment, leave the edge state as it is. Uh, I can consider the infinite sequences and say, well, if I made a discrete Fourier transform, the infinite sequence of integers is equivalent to states in Hilbert space on the circle. The circle is this angle running from minus one half to one, or okay. minus pi to pi, or minus one half to one half. That angle is just a Fourier transform of the states there. So going from the integers to the circle is a question of Fourier transform. Running. So that's an exact mathematical mapping that you can do. Now, the thing I'm going to do, which is somewhat dangerous, is I'm going to cut open the circle. Let's say the circle actually is a line from minus one half to one half. The one half, we, we put it here, but not there. So it's a line with one endpoint included and one endpoint excluded. That's the exact way of opening up the circle. Now take two pairs of integers. One of them I leave integer. The others are fully transformed to the circle. It's a half line with this one excluded and that's included. Well, mathematically, the product of these two is Hilbert space. It's just a Hilbert space of functions on a real line from minus infinity plus infinity. Because these line segments just neatly fit between all the integers. So now you can say, if I have a real number operator, I split up this real number into its integer part and its fractional part. Its fractional part is an angle. Its integer part is one of those integers. Together, they span the entire space. So, in other words, um, I can write Q that way, and so, so I have a state which is, which is also, if I have a little Q state, which is a real number, I split up as integer and fractional part, and then I do the Fourier transform respect to the fractional part, I get uh, the, the, the QP basis. So here I have a pair of integers, here are functions defined in the real line. I can do it for the real line of of the Q variables, I can then Fourier transform to go to the P variables. Now, at so first... So this psi is not your edge state, though? No, is it? sorry, this is the most general any sorry. state of psi. It's not my, my edge state, I'm not sure about psi edge or something like that. <coughs> sorry, yes. And um, um, 
So uh, this this tries any state for which this this holds, and I can decompose the state into this these base elements, which I characterize by pairs of integers. And now the claim is I can take a model where originally I say how pairs of integers trans transform or, or evolve in time, and then I can say, well, if I know that, then I can calculate how this operator little q evolves in time. And I can do it in position space, I can also do it in momentum space. Now, naively, if you look at this only for one second, but not more, then you say, wait a minute, uh, these q's and p's, and this little q, and then the little p if you fully transform that, that seems like interchangeable. Maybe I can have the same message in p space, and then go back from p to q. Yes, you can do that, but you don't get exactly the same answer. And uh, yeah, the reason has to do with the fact that if you have a block wave function, the Fourier transform of that of, of a wave function is only one between the segments is minus one half and one half is zero elsewhere. That would be the wave function where capital Q is specified and capital P is totally <laughs> unspecified. Um, that uh, um, no. Uh, the eta is an unspecified, the associated operator there will also be specified, and, uh, but it's not exactly zero. It's just a statement that if you Fourier transform a block wave function, the Fourier transform is something like sine of x, sin x over x, it's not a block wave function. So this picture is not entirely symmetric on the interchange of p and q, but nearly, approximately symmetric, but not quite. You can cure that by invoking a slightly more advanced form of mathematics. I'm going to skip that in this talk, if you're interested, I mean, it's in one of my papers about the subject. You can symmetrize the picture. You say, I'm not, not going to start with block wave functions, but wave functions are equal to their own Fourier transform, and uh, so the block has a little bit, spills a little bit over the edge, the Fourier transform also spills a little bit over its edge. But you, you can do this kind of mathematics, and then you find that Elements in the Hilbert space Q and P can be written as animals, uh, elements of the Hilbert space little q or little p, but you can symmetrize the procedure such that the expressions for little, for little q look the same as the expression for little p. Then I again compute the matrix elements, and these are the answers I get. It's a fairly lengthy calculation, but to check that the calculation makes sense is relatively easy, and that is because I again compute the commutator. If I symmetrize a picture, I get again a single edge state. Now I put, I should have put the edge before also as well. I have the, sim, the, the edge state in here, and um, there's only one edge state, which might be surprising because um, in the previous story, when I did one sequence of integers, I got the edge state. If you take two sequences of integers, you get the edge state for this and edge state for that. But this is multiplied by entire Hilbert space there, and this is multiplied by entire Hilbert space there. So if you would get the infinity batch states. I could reduce that by some, I think, smart mathematics, by having only a single edge state that you could not get rid of. The commutator between these p and little p and little q operators is the canonical commutator, but with, again, an edge state which ruins the commutator for one particular state. Now, this is a very large Hilbert space of an infinite many orthogonal modes, only one mode of Hilbert space doesn't obey the right commutation rule. So I have to exclude that. It's an edge state which is minus one to the power q plus p. That's where it doesn't work. All the others work exactly. So you can actually, you can nearly see it when you look at the equations that if you take the content in p and q, you have to multiply this with p1 minus, oh, that's something I forgot to mention. Uh, this Q here is Q1 minus Q2, or this P is P1 minus P2. So if you take the commutator, you have to multiply this with P and with Q, and uh, you find that um, uh, that in both cases, uh, this expression comes up. So, um, so this is an, a nice way of mapping between pairs of integers and, and real numbers. So uh, thinking now of, say, planets moving in ellipses or something, you can take the planets moving in ellipses, but then you can put the planets on a grid and describe everything in terms of integers only, but the grid in position space and the grid in momentum space. Physically, it's sort of pleasing, because if you say both position and momentum are integers, 
It means automatically you have an uncertainty relation saying delta P times delta Q is 1. And roughly that uncertainty uh, relation is exactly what you get. The, 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 the grid size in P space and the grid size in Q space, the product of the grid sizes is 1 or, or 1 over 2 pi or whatever your normalization is, uh, just like the usual uncertainty relation. So physics speaking, it is sort of appealing that this comes out, not very surprising. Uh, the problem is very often you can't really use this. And that's because very often um, you are going to deal with equations in the evolution equation. You add two integers or you multiply integers, something like that. As soon as you add integers, the splitting up in terms of capital P and capital Q, Q becomes very complicated. If I take integer and shift it by a fractional amount, well then that might, you may, might still be able to handle but then if you add two integers and you ask how does one integer affect the other one, that becomes a rather horrible, non-linear, and non-useful. So although formally this mapping works, in many cases it becomes not useful. That was a, a big disappointment. I tried very hard, but very often it's not useful, except in one very interesting case, which is I can use this in one space, one time dimension. Think of a quantum field theory in one space, one time dimension. And I th I'm thinking of all the field variables at all points in the one dimensional space to be s such a, a real number to which I apply my mapping. Now, the equations in, and I'm now considering a, a massless field theory in one space, one time dimension. So the Klein Gordon equation is just simply this very simple expression which tells you right away in one space, one time dimension, a massless non-interacting field theory splits up into left goers and right goers. The left movers and right movers. And now I do my mapping for the left movers and the right movers. The nice thing about that is that the evolution equation is extremely trivial in this theory. The evolution equation is just that things move up to the right, the right movers move up to the right, the left movers move up to the left. You can describe that quantum mechanically, you can describe it classically as well, because there's no dispersion of these waves. So you could accuse me later that yes, your model works because there's no dispersion. But uh, anyway, it works. That's what I want to, to explain. Um, temporarily, you also put the x and y in the lattice. So we take the theory defined on a lattice, but later I'll take the limit of that lattice going to zero. And on that lattice, you have this as the field equations. So now you can say I can move by a distance a at a time. And then the field equation becomes again a very similar equation. Now I can apply my transformation onto the capital P and the capital Q to find that the capital Qs, again, obey the same equation, and so do the capital Ps. So in other words, in terms of the integers P and Q, you still get the same equations. But the P's and the Q's are commuting. And then you make an integer step in a time direction, again, you, you go into a, a, you enter into a state where again, all the capital P and capital Q operators all continue to commute. So when operators commute, you might be inclined to introduce Hilbert space anyway, but you're not forced to. You didn't describe them as a digestible object, just because non-commutation doesn't enter anywhere. So, the upshot of this is that it's very simple. In, in a massless field theory in one space, one time direction, I, and you, if you do it right, you find all commutators will disappear in, in this appropriately cho chosen basis, but your basis consists just of integers. And, um, um, well, here I, I describe the quantum theory saying that um, I have left movers and right movers, I write uh, the Momentum P also as a left mover and a right mover. A left mover is only a function of x plus t. The right mover is a function of x minus t. And th that, when you write this way, you can go back and find the AL in terms of the original P and, and phi operator. P is the momentum associated with field phi. Um, and you can write on a Hamiltonian, which is in the front of field theory, it would be this. And that Hamiltonian reminds one, by the way, of a dagger A, these, these A's behave very much like creation and annihilation operators of, of physical particles in that theory. So <coughs> that's the right moves in the momentum space that are really operators, which for the quantum theory are creation operators with physical particles. 
in the classical theory, they are just, um, well, I'll, I'll mention later, I'll, I'll do the same thing. Uh, I'll write the AL as a capital A plus, so uh, as, as an integer plus a fractional part. The fractional part are angles, p p minus one half and one half. These are integers. And I will always make this split in a unique way. Provided, of course, I let angles go from minus one half to one half, not from minus pi to pi. Otherwise, you get overlaps. You don't want that. So that's why, why I like to have this funny base of the logarithms. So I do that. And, and these then behave as basically classical fields. Um, so the splitting survives the evolution law. And they use a quantum Hamiltonian, <coughs> or rather its lattice space time version. Because remember, I had the axis and the t is also the lattice. So now you get some lattice artifacts. I don't want those lattice artifacts. I want all the solutions to go exactly with the speed of light. That forces me to have a slightly non-trivial Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian for the lattice theory is not exactly uh, a, a left square plus a right square, but in momentum space there is a modification factor, m of k. I have to choose it this way so that the Hamiltonian is not quite local in, in, in physical space, but nearly, but there is a slightly a term which depends weakly on the momenta. k over sine k for small k, that's just 1. But for large k, it deviates a bit from 1. But um, for k equals 1 half, the thing explodes to infinity. So you have, there is something to be worried about if this kappa equals plus or minus 1 half. That is an edge state in, in the base space of the theory as well. But OK, that's another topic. Um, this Hamiltonian turns the A left to a pure, pure left mover, moving the speed of light to the left, and the AI moves the speed of light to the right. And now I can split it up and say, well, my capital A is also a left mover in what I call a cellular automaton. Because it's really an automaton that has an infinite sequence of integers Q and, and P, and um, I can write them this way, and then I can have this equation between these Q variables to describe what I call the automaton. It's totally classical. It's what you can put in your computer. It's actually a very trivial automaton as well. It just contains left and right movers. But that automaton then, according to this argument, can be mapped one to one on the quantum field theory. So there you would say that if you want to do statistics, you might use the quantum version. Unfortunately, this scheme is very trivial because um, uh, uh, because when things left move only moves to the left and nothing else, nothing really happens, nothing of interest happens in this model. So we can accuse me of saying you know, this kind of very uninteresting models. Yes, that's true, but I think the fact that you can have this exact mapping is interesting. Now, for these models, it's all right. But now let's look at string theory. And this is a, looks like a big step. But that string theory is a theory based on one space, one time dimension. But now that's the world sheet of a string. So here comes a nice little uh, end to my talk, which is that for string theory, I can do the same thing. I can put, first of all, a lattice on the string world sheet. So that lattice has an arbitrary mesh. You can choose the meshes as large or as small as you please, because the string world sheet is not a physical space. It is just a parameter space for the string. You can make gauge transformation in the parameter space. Make the parameter as large or as small as you please. The physics doesn't change. So the lattice size actually has very little, if any, physical effect. And that comes a, a little surprise. If you calculate, if you calculate that also the P's and the Q's form a lattice, but now in the field space of this theory, what is the field space? The fields in string theory are the coordinates of the string. So when you have a left mover on a string, it really means that the coordinates of the left mover are fields well, the, the fields of the left mover are the coordinates of the string, and the, the complete coordinate of the setting of the string is obtained by adding the left movers to the right movers. And that's the way string theory works. So, since I'm talking now about integers, it means that this string lives on a lattice. You can now compute the lattice mesh parameter to find that it's totally independent on all the details of my theory, independent of what lattice I chose on the string world sheet. It cannot depend on that because the world sheet is an artificial way to parameterize the theory. You always get 
that the mesh length of the lattice is 2 pi times the square root of the alpha prime parameter of the string. This tells you what the slope of the string theory is. Normally, in the books, they quickly normalize alpha prime to 1 over pi or something like that. But, or, 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 or 1, uh, you, you choose some number because it, it's just the length scale of string theory. Every string theory has a fundamental length scale in it. Even in QCD, the length scale is the, typically a Fermi or so. So this says that the letters I'm looking at, in QCD it would be a, something like a Fermi. But in, uh, in, a, in the superstring theory, it would be something like the Planck length. Or the Planck, rather the string alpha prime parameter, you know that the alpha prime parameter is slightly larger than the Planck length. Um, because the string top becomes is somewhat weaker uh, than the one. And so the polygon of these two gives you Newton's constant. So Newton's constant defines Planck's scale, but uh, the string uh, the string interaction constant modifies that to get a lattice length which is a little bit larger than the Planck scale in this theory. Now this is a, oh yes, the string constant is presumably not fully adjustable. I'll say presumably. I'm, I'm just out of the phase where I thought I proved everything, but I didn't. There are still some problems with the theory. The problems I have are in the interactions. And in, oh, before I come to interactions, let me very briefly say something about fermions. The superstring has fermionic degrees of freedom. And you already saw that the Ising model is very suitable to, can be handled by using fermions, to play the same thing with fermions. The nice thing about what I said to one plus one dimensions, it can also be done for fermions, just like for bosons. The difference is that the discrete theory of fermions does not give you sequences of integers, but only pluses or minus ones. So like the Ising model, the degree of freedom is then a variable sigma, which is just plus one or minus one, so the evolution law is this. And then you can use very similar techniques to describe that as if it's a fermionic quantum field theory of one dimensions. But in super strength theory, you have as many fermionic fields as bosonic fields, and you, you make them obey a, a, a supersymmetry relation. But I can do exactly the same thing. So also, the fermionic part of the super string is really completely deterministic in this language. And um, so this is why I'm saying that this is the super strength theory. But um, basically, I should emphasize that the super strength theory has this but um, uh, it, the dual mapping between the discrete theory on lattice and a continuous quantum superstring theory really holds for the bulk of the system. It still has to be established whether it holds for the boundary equations. Um, the boundary conditions are still a problem. Also, I said nothing about the interactions yet, and there are the constraints. So superstring theory contains more than just a one plus one dimensional theory of axis moving on line, it also dictates how the line is closed to make closed strings. It also tells you what constraints there are and tells you what interaction string theory. So lots more. Not all that could be reproduced <coughs> in this theory, but at least I got somewhere. Um, so you have to ask about the longitudinal mode of the string. And um, string theory then tells you, okay, you choose the longitudinal modes, but you also have to choose a gauge constraint on the string world sheet. The gauge constraint one could use, for instance, is to gauge A plus the light cone component on space time to be just one. But then, if A plus is one, A minus is not equal to one. A minus is the sum of all the transverse modes squared. That is just the on shell condition of string theory. It's a gauge condition you have to impose on string theory which is usually bigger than one. So the string is asymmetric under the interchange A plus and A minus. That asymmetry is difficult to cure. And in my mapping <coughs> from integers to real numbers, that mapping depends on what choice you make here. Whether it's A plus is you choosing the one or A minus is, makes a difference. So the mapping seems not to respect Lorentz Lawrence transformation, Lorentz invariance. And I do not know how dangerous or how serious that problem is. Um, you could say that you start with your transverse modes. The transverse modes allow the exact mapping. How you concoct from the transverse modes what the longitudinal modes of the theory are, you use 
whatever book of science theory you can get, put your hands on to calculate that, that's for the quantum theory. The quantum theory is worse than that. The classical theory doesn't have to be. So in, in general, it is not, as you saw here. The classical theory is not going to vary. Perhaps you shouldn't care about that. So, so the, the lower transformation itself only comes about after you went to the quantum language. That, I thought, would, uh, I skipped this because my time runs out, I thought would be enough to try to introduce interactions. And even for the interactions, I had a candidate for interaction which would be deterministic as well. Which is, if two strings meet, they just exchange their arms. So two strings meet, and they flip, make a flip where they meet. And um, if you say that flip happens for certain, then it's a deterministic theory. The flip happens for certain in one direction, provided that the strings are oriented strings. If you choose orientation differently, the flip will flip the other way. So um, if these are oriented strings, then this is a unique prescription. What happens when two strings meet? And that is an interaction. And that's also a deterministic interaction. So I thought I was there until I realized that actually you have to say exactly at which point this happens, but also in the transverse directions. Uh, in longitudinal directions, you also need to know where this point is. So when you say that, it, it turns out that, that the exact prescription here does depend on how you, how you define A plus and A minus. That is a problem which I have not solved. So that's why uh, in, in the previous talks I thought this, this problem was basically easy to handle, but it's not easy to handle as far as I know. It is still a problem. But the bulk of the theory seems to be completely deterministic, or it can be mapped and it allows you to do a <coughs> to a completely deterministic theory. So what is, does that mean? A string theory is an interesting candidate, at least, to describe the fundamental forces of the Planck scale. And that interesting candidate has part of it, at least, that allows a complete mapping from quantum to classical. And my question there is, what does this mean for the physics of the Planck scale? Uh, to me, this actually, this analysis answers a very important question. Why do people say string theory is finite? Because I didn't see much fineness in that. I thought uh, these, these fields, these string coordinates, can be put in any fine grid. And uh, it will be tremendously infinite if you look at all modes in other space. But now that we see that actually the bulk of the theory lives on a lattice, not in a continuum, that is obviously locally finite. So this would be the real reason why string theory is finite. So at least I make progress for myself, not understanding what actually Ed Witten has been telling us all the time. The string theory is finite, but there's another reason which you couldn't really explain. Now, I think there are explanations here. There's also something classical about the string theory, which I would like to understand better. But um, so far, uh, of course, there's still many problems. So the conclusion is that, that string theory suggests that space and time can be put on a lattice. The lattice length will be 2 pi and alpha <coughs> square root alpha pi. Um, lattice on a world sheet can be sent to a continuum. That doesn't change anything. The world sheet is not really, uh, the cores on the world sheet don't, don't have a direct physical interpretation. Um, if I had more time, I would explain how I see it also explains how the wave function collapses. This is a very philosophical argument. That if you do a measurement, you end up, you start with a common theory, but then ends up giving a classical result, a measurement. Why, where did the wave function go? The famous Schrodinger cat problem. All that has obviously an easy answer if you believe this theory that actually this would be the way to turn quantum theories into classical theories. Uh, also the Born rule, the fact that the square of the amplitude must be interpreted as a probability is very straightforward to see how that comes about in such a theory. But the difficulty, of course, is again, Bell. What do I do with that gentleman? He was a friend of mine. I, I respected his argument very much. So there's a problem about Bell's inequalities. My time is running out. So if you want to stop me, right. you can just give me a few uh, extra minutes here. Or yeah. So uh, when I explained Bell's argument, there was an essential ingredient argument that was the Alice and Bob could independently choose where, which axis to use to measure the spin. Now, independently choose, what does that mean? Well, they say they have free will. 
and I said, wait a minute, if, if John, if, if, if Alice and Bob I live in a theory of everything is deterministic, they have no such free will. Whatever they decide lies in their past, whether you like it or not. And then people say, yeah, but that's not the answer. Because if you believe that, then uh, you must accept either some kind of ridiculous fine tuning or conspiracy. Conspiracy means that somehow this decaying atom and it puts flags and photons knew right in advance what Bob and Alice would be going to do. Well, yes, they can know that in advance because there are space like correlations. In all our quantum field theories, there are tremendously large space like correlations. I mean, correlations between operators which are space like separated. We know that the quantum field theory was the, the propagator is based on that. The propagator takes two points in space, the space like separated, or time like, as you please. In both cases, the functions are correlated, and that gives you the propagator. Once you know the propagator, and once you know all the other correlation functions, you know the entire scattering matrix. And basically, this whole experiment is a gigantic scattering matrix. So basically, scattering matrix already lies included in the uh, the, the space-like correlations of this theory, so the, the decaying atom does know something. It is space-like correlated with all those degrees of freedom which made Bob and Alice take the decision. But then they say that is conspiracy. How can you know how can be correlated? And that's the big question. How could uh, the decaying atom know exactly how Bob and Alice are, are going to choose their axis? How could they predict that? And of course, the answer is they don't predict that. Just happen that way. There's no way you can find out from DK atom what Bob and Alice will predict. But um, somehow the deterministic theory does know it. And I think that's actually a feature rather than a part in my theory that, that yes, the DK atom knows in advance what other component you're going to make. Because that's the real ontological state of the photon that is, it is emitting. So these are very deep issues which. Um, very difficult to, to understand. So I go again in the dark experiment at T zero long ago before experiments had been done. Um, I must take my answer that the degrees of freedom uh, that later forced as above to make the decisions and the source that emits the two entangled particles have a three body correlation. And as an exercise, I computed that three body correlation that you need minimally uh, at here such that Bob and Alice later do their quantum measurements. So little a, little b are whatever variables in this past force Bob and Alice to make the decision to, to choose a particular angle along which they're going to measure their spin. And those things are then correlated, and the function is the absolute value of the sine function. So that is the, the, compute, the computation of that correlation function. Or there's an st even stronger correlation, which I say worse means a stronger correlation, because people don't like such correlations, they say that's conspiracy. But I think that actually conspiracy is something that you might have to accept in these theories. So exactly how that goes is, of course, very, very difficult. I think, um, um, uh, so, uh, it could be, that actually the, the question about what is the ontological, ontological means the, the real thing. What is the real thing you're looking at? What is the real photon? And it's somehow a function of the wave functions that you're looking at. But the wave function you're looking at is actually the wave functions in spirit of this transformation which I, I uh, described. And so only a very small subset of wave functions describe ontological states. Whatever wave functions describe ontological states, that will be conserved in time. So um, it is that conservation law that it should save the day for these theories. But it's very difficult to convince to critical people uh, you know, why this is a, a tenable argument at all. So I, I leave it up to you how tenable it is, but I like to continue with studying my models where we can map a deterministic theory or a quantum theory. And I hope it's, it's getting me somewhere, and eventually it should get me at saying something more trivial about Planck scale physics, such as string theory. So I'll end here, you'll find more on these uh, publications. And I, I'm writing a more extensive article on the whole subject, which 
might take quite some time to appear. Anyway, this is a uh, line. I'd be happy if there would be critical remarks and I've got time to say. Thank yeah, well, thank you very much. <laughs> So um, I can take the Schrodinger equation yes. and solve it on a computer. Yes. And therefore, I'm doing classical physics. Right? And, <clears throat> and then the Schrodinger equation has um, you know, base bells and equalities. There, there's, in fact, you, know, you even said the collapse is a result of the Schrodinger equation. And mm -hmm. if you take an Everett view, you, you're happy just with what the Schrodinger equation gives you for all those issues. <clears throat> so um, I'm having trouble understanding what's different. And in fact, even people like to think, you know, you put something on a lattice and that can give you one way to regulate um, a theory. So I'm curious. Well, the it's Schrodinger still very equation, quantum mechanical, you, you right? The Schrodinger equation uh, basically describes all possible modes, right? You take the, the equation that you de is defined in Hilbert space. A Hilbert space contains all possible states the system can be in. Mm -hmm. That's what I would call the, the many world interpretation. So every single possibility of thing, something that might possibly happen if you're in during some process of the experiment is taken into account. So that's the many world picture. That there's right. infinitely many different worlds right. that you have to consider. You know, only if you know all what happens in all these worlds, you can calculate what happens right. finally. Um, and even that's kind. Of Right. In some sense, classical if yeah. you solve the Schrodinger equation. On I, the think it, I think the difficulty of that would be the, the Schrodinger scat problem. That, um, uh, <coughs> well, it's, it's a famous problem that the cat can be either dead or alive, and, and you, you ask what happens if, if it's in a superposition of these two states. Why do we never see a cat which is superimposed and being dead or alive? We only see either dead cat or alive yeah. cat, but never something Well, like I think it. there's answers. You know, obviously, you're not happy with them, but there's answers to that, and people calculate. You know the physics of making a measurement and find that you yes. only ever see one or the other. You know that there's two copies of you that see different outcomes and so on. Yeah. But is but it's just on a more technical level, and I like your green line. <laughs> so 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 is is there a clear conceptual difference? So when I see you know that you've done a mapping, I think fine. Well, I can I can do a much less fancy mapping just by literally putting the Schrodinger equation, yeah. plugging it into some algorithm on a computer, and it's all it's all bits down at some level. And that's a mapping from a finite classical yeah. system into quantum. Is, it, is there some key conceptual piece that's very different in what you're doing? Yeah, I, I think it's probably the number of degrees of freedom that you get. So are you I cutting mean, suppose down? That, yes. Okay. Suppose that... Um, uh, I take the universe and I add, you know, one extra degree of freedom in the universe, one particle, mm -hmm. that in the standard, well, in a deterministic theory of the kind I am considering, you just have taken the degrees of freedom of that particle and uh, that would be a, just a minor extension to your computer program. In your program, you now have to take all the states of that, that atom, the atom of one, and, and all the universe of the other. And, and so you're multiplying the number of variables by um, I think a factor two for the whole universe. Whereas if you're more economical, you just add a single degree of freedom of that single atom and nothing more. So I think it's a question of economy. And I also think that <clears throat> the difficulties I'm having with quantizing this two plus one dimensional theory of gravity it would be exactly that. that. How big is my Hubble space? How big is <clears throat> how does nature's bookkeeping system work? Is it exponential in the number of degrees of freedom, or is it just linear in the number of degrees of freedom? I think that's going to be the kind of questions that you have to ask. So do you foresee um, sort of observable effects? No, but I, I foresee possibly that new ideas for grand unified theories might come up, or a string theory. My prediction of a, of a world sheet lattice is not trivial. In fact, the fact that I say this thing interaction has to be the exchange of two arms should give you restrictions on the string coupling constant, which normally people don't find. So I think I might find new restrictions on what standard model, standard model like interactions should be. That would be the best of all worlds, so if that would be true. Then, then I could say, yes, my theory helps <coughs> in designing good theories on a time scale. So, so is it going to, I'm concerned if it doesn't affect sort of day to day physics. 
it sounds like you still have a pretty big hill of space. Yeah. And you still have the Schrodinger cat. I don't, then it's hard for me to see how you're going to help us or well, change the Schrodinger cat. I'm not worried about the Schrodinger cat, but for people who are, they want something different. Do you think do you think this is going to step in and change anything about the, Schrodinger, the no, actual Schrodinger cat? No, it should not change the physics. So yeah. the solution of the Ising model is a nice example because it doesn't say quantum mechanics is wrong or anything, but the opposite. It, it uses the techniques of quantum mechanics, which is exactly right. And it doesn't say quantum mechanics is wrong. It doesn't say that the, the real thing is, a quantum, is the Ising model. It's just, it's just a tool. Mm -hmm. And that's how I would like to view it, quantum mechanics, just being a tool. A very efficient tool, indeed. But it, is but, a tool. but it sounds like we're still stuck with the Schrodinger cat, for better or worse. I think and I'm this, not. Because, oh. um, so what's different? Um, because the number of, of actual physical states, I make now a clear distinction between ontological states and uh, the states you get by infinite superpositions. The, uh, the, the two states of the cat being dead or the cat being alive are both ontological states. The superposition of two cats is not an ontological state. So that is not a state that can ever occur in the real world. But you don't think there's any observable effect as I track myself from the you know, the Geiger counter to the poison to the No, uh, the, the theory would only make sense if there would be no observable, direct observable effect at the large scale or at atomic scale of physics. I believe quantum mechanics is exactly correct at atomic scale of physics. Mm -hmm. I believe quantum mechanics is still correct at a Planck scale, but not the most efficient way to describe it. Okay. Yeah. So as you talked, I kept asking myself, is there any way of translating what you're saying into a past ethical point of view? That's a good question. Um, oh yes, I think it is. Very simple. I replace, I take the same path integral integrand, but now instead of adding a wave function, uh, an amplitude to all the paths that you can have, my only amplitude I accept are ones and zeros. So there's a path that has an amplitude one, then yes, that path takes place. The path to every zero says, no, that path never going to take place. Now, that would make life a lot easier. Actually, it could be an answer to your question as well, but uh, if, uh, if you could simplify the path integral to that extent, it would make life a lot easier uh, to, to understand how physical models work. And yeah, I'm, I'm, all for, theory, I'm all for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the generic quantum theory would say every path has its amplitude. You have to integrate over all those amplitudes. My theory says, no. There's only two paths, all the other paths are wrong, and that but, makes things a lot easier. But I claim that that is just a subspace of the general space. The wave functions where the amplitude is 1 or 0 is a possible path integral that you can encounter in the real quantum mechanics. If you go to the right basis of Hilbert space, you might encounter that the amplitudes in the path integral in that basis are just 1s and zeros. But so I'm that worried I, that if that's going to change the Schrodinger cat, there's going to be some observable I have no, trouble seeing how that's Unless you have totally observed separate. Schrodinger cat in, in the quantum superposition. Well, people do that in the lab. I mean, people have a whole range of things they probe at different levels of, of macroscopic, you know, macroscopicity. And, and they see yeah. quantum. It's always quantum yeah. whenever they look. And so I think as you, if the, you're really, I mean, this sounds like a deep, like a really yeah. different of math, and mm -hmm. I'd expect it to show up. If it, if it, my guess is if it changes the Schrodinger cat, it's gonna, there's going to be something observable, maybe not with the cat itself, but in some... Mm -hmm. That's a maybe, maybe related question to that. So if you have, you have a deterministic theory, so I, well, that seems to me that that, uh, that would mean that you would say that one of the most basic features of quantum mechanics is gone, namely that Quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics tells us if you prepare exactly the same experiment over and over again, you won't get the same result every time, right? And so you would say that no, actually, because when you're getting different results, there are some hidden variables that are secretly different each time, kind of like experimental noise, right? But, you know, quantum mechanics really says that it doesn't matter. There is no experimental noise. Even if you perfectly prepare the experiment, you get a different answer. So at some point, it would seem that that if these variables are <laughs> physical, you should be able to see some effects of them, these hidden variables. Well, because otherwise, why wouldn't I get, you know, why, you know, uh, 
Are you, otherwise, you would have to explain why an experimentalist who actually does an experiment over and over again and thinks they're doing it exactly the same, why not? There has to be some physical thing different each time they do it. <coughs> well, if you look at series and you look at the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is very, it's actually the generator of the time evolution. It's a complicated operator that's not a diagonal operator at all in the uh, even in its ontological states. So if you diagonalize the Hamiltonian and you look at the lowest eigenvalue, you get the vacuum state. So the thing we call the vacuum state must be a very complicated super quantum superposition of all states that nature can be in. It doesn't mean that we really are in that quantum superposition. It means all our understanding of the vacuum state is as, as best as possible described by that quantum superposition. It means that we don't know what all the hidden variables in the vector actually are. So that's why if you repeat the experiment, every time you repeat it, you thought you start with the same vacuum around you. But it's not. The vacuum around you can be in, in countless numbers of different states. So you repeat the experiment with a different vacuum. You thought the vacuum was the same, it isn't. It's different. And that's why the outcomes experiment will be different every time. So is the wave function peaked in this case where it's normally not at all peaked? OK, the wave function eventually will be peaked. If you choose the right basis, it will be completely picked. Now, what I didn't mention here, I should have, if I have more time, was that there's a suspicion that the macroscopic basis, the basis of people, of planets, of meteorites, and so on, that that is diagonal in the sub, in the Planck world basis. So that basically the question whether there's a planet here or no planet here can be figured out if you do statistics on what the cellular automata do at, the, at those spots. In other words, it's highly in nearly inevitable to believe that the macroscopic states are diagonal in terms of the ontological base at the microscopic level. If you say that, then indeed um, uh, 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 there is no superposition between macroscopic states. And in terms of macroscopic states, can the wave function automatically get peaked. And that's why I call collapse of the wave function. So, so can we talk to the short Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I mean, you're. There are other people yes, with questions. Sorry, yes. sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we can continue this discussion. Yeah, let's discuss this. Yes. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> no, no, go ahead. I'm just going to say that. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, I can see. So, you're talking about how long range order in vacuum fluctuations could result in yes. um, quantum mechanical like effects. For example, like atomic interferometry, you might, I can imagine like interference patterns in long range order resulting in you know things that look like interference patterns. <coughs> I have a hard time seeing how the same kind of effect could influence the minds and decisions of players like Alice and Bob. And I know this is sort of what you're talking about with the conspiracy, but could you it seems like that would be kind of an extraordinary, extraordinary claim. The same kind of thing that could produce like these sort of simple interference-like effects could also be inter influencing really large-scale kind of classical systems like the human brain. Yeah. So that is just the general conspiracy question, um, which has always been brought forward as an argument against what I'm saying now. That yes, you can never reproduce that kind of conspiracy. But I claim that what really inspiring is a conserved quantity. That what is ontological, what's the real physical state, is conserved. Once you start with an ontological state, which is a state which is delta peaked for all the true states and zero for all the wrong states, it will remain being so when the evolution continues. So we know that in the very end, Bob is not decisions will be peaked. Mm -hmm. So we know that because of that, we know that since it's peaked, and since there's a conservation law, it must have been peaked all the time. So, and these peaks show enormous correlations everywhere. So the correlations at time equals zero in the previous slide, uh, those correlations are such that, yes, uh, what Bob and Alice had in their mind is, is, is a result of, uh, of very complicated uh, classical interactions in this automaton. Okay, thanks. So, Steve, but it's I hard to it's imagine. Turn. <laughs> and I, I don't know, maybe Steve uh, well, had a question. Okay, so I had a question similar to some of these others, mm -hmm. but um, I'm trying to understand as a t 
feature of undergraduate quantum mechanics in particular, what interference would look like in this picture? That is, for example, in your two-dimensional uh, particle. Suppose that I take in the quantum theory an initial state, which is a superposition of, of two peak states in a way that that gives me an interference pattern. How, what, what is the process in the deterministic model that reproduces the quantum effect of, this, of the superposition? Well, you call it a quantum effect. Of course, strictly speaking, it's not quantum mechanical. It's just saying that if you send a beam of particles through its two slits, that it, uh, generically you'll get uh, more particles here and a few particles there. That statement itself is totally classical. But of course, you recognize those fringes as the thing you get when you calculate how water waves behave or something like that. You also see those fringes. So it's your responsibility that you make that, that, that connection. Um, but basically, you say, well, if you, you can call it a quantum effect, but it could be the result of classical interactions. But I think that I can do this with a single particle, that if I send a single photon through two slits, uh, through a two, to a two-slit apparatus, there will be some places where I can say that in a classical theory I would see a photon, but in the quantum theory the probability is zero of seeing a photon. Yes. So there it's not a statistical effect. There must be something about the, the evolution there. So yeah. this could be, a in the classical theory, it would be just a consequence of these tremendously intricate uh, local correlations and also global correlations of large distances. Mm -hmm. so all these correlation functions have waves in them. And those yeah. could be results of classical interactions. I don't see why yeah. that shouldn't be. Okay. So, <clears throat> if, to summarize uh, a bit, if, you're, if you want to promise uh, economy, as you said, oh, just, and determinism, and that quantum mechanics is correct, exactly correct on the atomic scale, uh, but you're not promising locality because you want conspiracy, so, then even with the first three, it seems then that as a corollary that you think that uh, quantum computation has not been correctly developed. Okay, that quantum computation is a very interesting uh, thing to think about in this context because I would be saying that a quantum computer can in principle be mimicked by a classical theory at the Planck scale. So that suggests that a computer scientist could rebuild his computer at the Planck scale <laughs> and, <laughs> and make a classical computer do the same things as this quantum computer does. So I have actually a conjecture. Uh, I think it's actually a theorem that follows on this theory. That is, that if you take a, finally someone succeeds in making a quantum computer and he can factor tremendously large integers in terms of the prime factors and using the sure algorithm. And all these things you can actually do. <coughs> my conjecture or my prediction would be that quantum computer does miracles, yes. But the miracles could be outperformed by a classic computer if you scale it to the Planckian dimensions. Now, of course, nobody can make computer elements at the Planck scale. So let's let them make computer elements at the, at the micron scale or something like that. But then you say you scale transform this whole thing as if it looks like a quantum, like this classic computer at the Planck scale. Once you scale this one, it will become much faster and, and its memories will become much bigger. It would outperform the quantum computer. And that's a non-trivial prediction because it's, wait a minute, it's said quantum computer can do non-polynomial non problems that the classic computer cannot. So this statement is a non-trivial one because now I say, no, yes, the quantum computer can do non-polynomial problems, but not too non-polynomial. You know, there's a limit to what the quantum computer can do. It will sooner or later be, uh, be interfered with by, by uh, decoherence effects or something like that. Some effects that people say, well, you know, there's a, there's a disturbance here. There's, there's neutrinos from the early Big Bang who are, 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 are you know, slightly 
displacing my wave functions and, and causing decoherence. Oh, the gravitational waves, that was what to find some excuse that <laughs> is, de is decohering. So you would like to say then that quantum computing will look like, looks like it will give you things, that these algorithms that are exponentially faster, but it, soon enough the fun will stop and the noise will prevent it. Yes. Still, since no one can ever make a classical computer at the Planck scale, if you make such a quantum computer, it will still be a tremendous achievement and it could still be extremely helpful to humanity. But the, the degree of non polynomialness of the, of the problem will be limited. It can, it can factor much larger numbers than the classical computer can do, but not numbers with millions of decimal places, because then you can easily show that even the, 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 the classic computer at the Planck scale would not be able to do that. So, uh, so then you say there will be a limit. Unless someone finds a better algorithm for classical computers, that's the other question. But, um, but generally speaking, this is my prediction. Okay, well, I think uh, you know, further questions maybe could be handled uh, after we thank Gerard. I'm sure he'll hang around for a little bit.